we're going to start in a minute so we'll just hopefully there'll be a couple more people jumping on um but if you just want to type into the chat where you're from and where you're joining for us today that would be amazing just so we can say hello um i'm rachel uh, one of the school engagement officers at state library Indeed, do we want to give everyone another minute or two to join us or shall we make a start? Uh, I'm happy either way, maybe just until 4.03. That's yep. all good. Yep, sounds like a plan. Thank you so much, guys, who have already tuned in right at four. It's great to have you here. And just um, hello, I'm Natasha, the coordinator of the school's engagement team at the State Library. Just um, if you missed the announcement that we are recording today's session so that it can be available um, post, post our time slot for today, um, you're welcome to keep your cameras on or you can turn them off. Um, and if you have any questions or want to engage, you can uh, just reach out through the chat window. I think Rachel's going to get into those details, but while we're waiting, if there's anything else there in housekeeping, Rachel, you can probably tackle that while we wait for a few more friends to join us. Uh, no, just that, yeah, we're, just if you've got questions during the chat right at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so if you have any questions that uh, pop up, um, feel free to add them. So I'll just keep an eye on the chat as it's going and then um, we will pepper India with questions uh, right at the end. Um, If you've just joined us, we're going to start in a minute or so, um, but we'd love to know where you've come, where you're coming from. And we've also, um, I'll mention it again in a minute, but we're recording um, today's session uh, just so that we can add it to our amazing collection of uh, resources at, on Curriculum Connect um, and a transcript as well. Um, if you'd like to turn off your microphones, because sometimes there's unintentional feedback um, that having learnt through the last couple of years of all the pitfalls that happen when you're doing these kind of things. Um, microphones are a big one. Okay, I th think we're good. Yep, all right, excellent. Okay. So um, welcome and hello everyone. Thank you for joining us at this the State Library of Queensland Schools Engagement Webinar, uh, Childhood at War, which is presented by India Dixon. Um, there she is, one of the curators at State Library. My name is Rachel and I'm part of the school's engagement team at State Library. Uh, we, um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we stand and we meet virtually today. State Library of Queensland owns Yagara and Turbo land and this land has been a meeting and gathering place for in Aboriginal people for a millennia. I'd also like to pay respect to the traditional custodians from where you are joining us today and to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the audience. I'm also joined by our coordinators, School Engagement Natasha, who manages our, as she is, giving us a wave, uh, School's Engagement team will be facilitating the session with me today. And of course, um, also on camera, and already, she's already given us a wave, is our presenter, India. Uh, before I formally introduce and hand over to India, I want to remind you this session is being recorded and will be made available to all who have registered and on the State Library's Curriculum Connect website as a learning resource. Natasha and I will be monitoring the chat throughout today's session, so please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat window as we go. We'll also be having a Q&A session at the end if time permits for any unanswered questions. So we hope to be able to hear from you. The session should finish at 5pm today. Uh, and for those who aren't aware, last one last night before I hand over to 
India. For those who aren't aware, Anzac Square is a space in Brisbane City under the Shrine of Remembrance where military history can uncover and shared. Um, so I'll now hand over to India to tell us about the impact of World War II and children in Australia. Thank you, India. Oh, who we've lost. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There she is. Hello, sorry, no idea what just happened. It just decided to disappear on me and that's okay. Um, okay, I'm back though. Let me see if I can quickly screen share. Sorry to interrupt the end of your um, fantastic introduction. Let me see how I can do this. Let's go like this. Okay. We're jumping in. We are going to. Whoop. Yep. Okay. All right. Let me go in here real quick. Can you see me? Am I still, is my is my slideshow showing itself correctly? Sorry, guys. Um, you're there, you're there, India, um, but behind you is still the base screen of the slideshow. Okay, give me two seconds to fix that. Oh, okay. Let me go ahead. That. Okay. How's that looking? That's better. Wonderful. All right. So now that we're in and I'm moving, great. So I also would just like to quickly respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which this event is taking place and pay my respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, just as a quick preface to this talk, um, there are going to be images of uh, deceased individuals um, included in this presentation. Um, there are also going to be quite a few uh, topics and themes that I will discuss that will be um, sensitive to some people. And um, as a result, I would just like to advise uh, discretion just in case. And if you do wanna jump out of the chat and come back in at any point in time, or if you need to just walk away, that's a okay. Um, so, uh, just to let you guys know as well, real quick, um, my job here at State Library is as a librarian with Queensland Memory. Essentially, what my job is to do is uh, I build the collections. So I go through um, various client queries and I seek out uh, donations of original materials related to uh, war and peacekeeping efforts. Uh, performed by Queenslanders and as part of Queensland's defence history. So that involves everything from the Boer War all the way up until modern um, veterans' experiences. Um, but my particular focus uh, is on World War II and um, I have a particular interest in um, uh, women's uh, movements, rights, um, roles throughout World War II, as well as um, the home front and uh, all the social changes that occurred during uh, World War II for those located in Australia and how the uh, international sort of relations impacted Australia's culture and Queensland's culture during that period. Uh, so today I will be discussing a little bit of that, but mostly I'll be talking about um, how childhood was specifically influenced by World War II. And uh, we'll be going through a couple of different sort of key case studies and um, events that really impacted the way Queensland viewed both the war and viewed its own identity. And we're going to have a look as well at some of the um, sort of key points here on the curriculum that uh, should be covered hopefully in the talk. And if you have any questions about any of these and how some of the material that I show can be used to um, leverage and scaffold students to uh, approach those topics and develop a bit of nuance and critical thinking, more than happy to help with any of that. And um, yeah, happy to answer any questions and provide a bit of information and background for any collections that happen to pique your interest. Um, so 
without further ado, let's have a little look. So um, first and foremost, I think it's important that we recognise that the Australian experience is not the same as it was in other allied nations. Um, that may seem obvious, of course, to uh, the history teachers amongst us, but uh, it's not so obvious to students who may have only uh, really approached the topic of World War II through things like the Chronicles of Narnia or watching the film Dunkirk or Saving Private Ryan or any of those kinds of things. Um, it's important to sort of ensure that students understand that Australia's experience wasn't that of Britain's or uh, America's and to help them understand that even compared to World War One, this was a very, very different experience, not just for the soldiers, but also for the children and for those left on the home front. Um, part, partly because of the geographical difference and the changes in technology that made those distances seem in the sort of public mindset a lot smaller than they were in World War I. Um, but also because of the split war fronts, of course, the introduction of um, the Japanese and the war in the Pacific made uh, Australia uniquely positioned to experience war in a completely different way to what it had ever done so before. Um, and there were just a lot of similar experiences to the allied forces, but also different because of, again, the unique kind of cultural and geographical um, uh, factors that come into play when you're looking at Australia and Australian history. Uh, okay. Um, everyone can still hear me. I'm still on screen. Yes, I've only got my red box of PowerPoint, so I have no idea. Um, okay, so let's have a quick look at the proximity to war. So this, I think, is honestly the most uh, formative part of the uh, Australian experience when it comes to World War II and why it is such an important thing to look at. Um, because the proximity to war um, hadn't, like, Australia hadn't really ever faced war and the concept of invasion ever in its past. I mean, you look at places like uh, Fort Lytton, which were built in Brisbane as a uh, way of supposedly defending against this concept of um, Russian invasion right at the turn of the century, just before Federation. Um, and I mean, that is kind of that is kind of the closest we ever felt to getting invaded at any point in time. There was newspaper articles discussing things like the Tsar coming to build his summer palace down here in Australia on the Queensland coastline, and that's why Fort Lytton had to get built. Um, but it wasn't really ever a concern during World War I because we were fighting on behalf of European nations, and that's how it started, obviously, for us as well in World War II. But with the introduction of Japan into uh, the war, and uh, into Pearl Harbor and the, the global arena, um, that threat suddenly became incredibly real to Australia and we had to uh, approach it and approach our coordinated government and social efforts ag against the war and within the war uh, in a completely different way to what we had in uh, any and all previous events. Um, and that, of course, was disproportionately impactful upon Queensland, as well as the Northern Territory and parts of um, Western Australia. Um, you know, uh, Queensland did receive bombing just like Darwin and just like the top of Western Australia did. Um, there were threats of um, surveillance and reconnaissance and um, uh, potential invasion and our infrastructure completely changed incredibly rapidly over the sort of span of that first 18 months when Japan entered the war as a result of that potential threat of invasion. Um, so it's important as well to sort of recognize that um, yeah the the Japanese assault from the north down through the Pacific was truly unprecedented as far as anything that Australia had been able to predict or to see in any kind of previous warfare that anyone had lived through at the time. Um, the Japanese movement, they, I mean, they, they bombed Pearl Harbor in, on the 7th of December and by, uh, by uh, Valentine's Day, 
uh, in the following year. So a mere three months later, they had captured 15,000 Australian soldiers at the fall of Singapore and had ousted some of the uh, leading members of the US military from what was considered to be a tactical stronghold. And uh, as a result, you know, that domino effect occurred down through the Pacific and we were suddenly facing down things like the Battle of the Coral Sea. So although we know now with hindsight that uh, the Japanese weren't truly considering at any point in time a uh, full on invasion, it was still something that was very, very present within the uh, fears of the Australian public and within the Queensland public as that first kind of line, uh, uh, that port of call for, you know, geographic invasion. Um, as a further side note, um, it's interesting to look at things like why Japan entered the war and the kinds of um, cultural influences that were occurring in Japan at the time that sort of nudged them into joining the war and taking the opportunity to um, you know, essentially do a land grab. Um, you know, you have to look at the pivotal cultural shift in Japan, essentially occurring at across a single generation, they moved from feudalism straight into industrialization. And so there was this unique kind of cultural um, disparity between what had always been socially and what was now uh, possible through technology. And um, Japan historically has been a uh, resource low but population heavy uh, country. And so when you look at the countries that they invaded first and the way that they moved strategically through the Pacific, you see that they uh, captured small island nations that were resource rich. So they would take countries that had high resources in tin, iron and copper in order to try and further their um, military foothold and increase that means of production. Um, however, moving back to Queensland, um, the changing geography of war is something that obviously occurred not only in all of those other militarized countries at the time, you know, Japan was attempting to, as I just said, you know, build up this uh, huge base of resources for themselves and back up their huge population with the firepower for the manpower. Uh, in Queensland, that threat of attack forced us into building and um, creating these vast sort of networks of resource bases and infrastructure for uh, manpower to move through the country. Australia is a very large country. Queensland is very, very big. And so uh, we kind of dispersed a lot of those resources regionally. So when you look at a map of Queensland and you look at all of the different kinds of um, war-related infrastructure that were built, it's not just along the coastline, it's all um, inland as well, all the way to places like uh, Mount Isa, Charters Towers, all of those sorts of places also had bases um, for things like um, air airports and uh, munitions dumps and um, up along the far north sort of uh, Queensland coast, you will find things like mustard gas deposits still left in the soil because we were um, producing mustard gas in the uh, preparation for Japan actually um, violating that clause of the Geneva Convention. If they started to use chemical warfare, we were stockpiling chemical warfares of our own to actually use in that event. And when, of course, that never eventuated, these vast deposits of mustard gas were actually just put in barrels and left in fields to rot. And so occasionally you do find that people will put their foot through mustard gas barrels. But that's an entirely different anecdote. In terms of actual physical home front geographical changes, you were looking at things in city centres like Brisbane that were almost um, blitz, London Blitz-esque. You were looking at saltwater channels built into the roads uh, and along the sidewalks in order to allow for salt water to get pumped up from the river and um, blasted on a, on a block by block basis for any kinds of firefighting attempts that needed to happen. We were genuinely preparing for full-fledged air raids, just like what we were seeing coming out of um, London and out of France and out of all of those European countries that were getting bombed to hell and back. Pardon my French. Um, air raid shelters were a really significant thing in Brisbane and they're uh, an ongoing uh, relic and icon even within the Brisbane landscape. Um, there are 17, as far as we're aware, that are still standing of these um, 
uh, very, very distinct uh, Brisbane government built air raid shelters that were public air raid shelters. Um, there were submarine bases along the river. Um, yeah, air, air bases that still form the current um, regional airline flight paths. And all of that, of course, was extensively mapped at the time as well. Um, and it's a really fascinating thing to look at the maps of those um, air bases and the infrastructure that was developed because they um, are held at State Library 1 and they're in the process of getting digitised. Um, but they also show you things like counter surveillance measures as well. Um, which were, of course, being undertaken. Um, and on this sort of topic and trying to help unpack for students the concept of um, wartime and the vast home front changes that were occurring, um, I've put together a map of all of those air raid shelters that I was just discussing because, as I'm sure you guys know, working with high school students and getting them to actually connect with black and white photographs and with history that seems all too distant to them can sometimes be really difficult. And so uh, this map is, has been put together as a way of allowing students to go and find the air raid shelters and actually stand in front of them, physically acknowledge that they're here and that these were built expressly for this purpose and that this is not some sort of crumbling ruin necessarily, this is living architecture this is a living piece of our landscape currently and um, in many ways that can help to um, bridge that gap I think for students in a way that sometimes black and white photography or even side by side comparisons uh, just doesn't um, and so this is a potential class exercise that could be done as homework it could be done as a afternoon um, you know field trip or anything like that um, and so that is something that is a little bit fun. And you're welcome to um, grab that Google link off the screen. It will also be shared with you later in a resource list that I've put together for you. Um, but it's a lot of fun and I had a lot of fun finding all of them. Um, so the attack, the, the Japanese attack upon Queensland and the Japanese attack and entry into World War II, um, resulted in a number of sort of significant events and chain reactions that set off the policies that we now know formed the basis of Queensland's home front um, efforts. So um, it's important that students know that Australia didn't, um, it, it wasn't exempt from things like bombings. It wasn't exempt from things like um, the sinking of civilian vessels. Um, this was not something that was on a distant shore. This was something that was actually felt and feared right here in Brisbane or at home in Townsville, in Rockhampton, all the way up and down the uh, eastern and western uh, coastlines of Australia. Um, the bombings at Townsville were significant. Um, there were a total of three bombings in Townsville. There were bombings in the Torres Strait, uh, numbering in at six. Uh, Horn Island specifically was bombed because it had an airstrip um, that was used by a variety of different um, US and Australian forces to sort of stop in, refuel, and then continue going up north. Um, of course, the Battle of the Coral Sea was a major um, uh, event in Australia's sort of history. It was a really pivotal point as well for us in terms of the threat of invasion and the newspaper articles surrounding it are really fascinating. But what's more fascinating about it uh, than even the tactical uh, tide turning of it is the fact that um, missions in far north Queensland had uh, ration packs and canned goods and ice cream machines washing up on the beaches for three months after the uh, the battle actually occurred because the US uh, aircraft carrier that sank as a result of um, leaving the site of the battle uh, ended up having all of these materials wash away as part of the flotsam. And uh, in New Guinea, there were uh, big pallets of uh, rowing oars from lifeboats still washing up 12 months later. So the Australian coast was just littered with the debris of this particular battle. And it was, again, 
all too present in the uh, mindset of the home front people and children were not exempt from that. Children would be beachcombing for these kinds of things. Um, and it's a really interesting thing to remind ourselves that Australia truly did have a, um, a foreign threat on its doorstep as far as we were concerned. Um, it's interesting, of course, as well, because everyone knows that Darwin was bombed. Everyone knows that uh, it was sort of over that first year of the Japanese entering the war, this big sort of onslaught of a, a, a kind of blitzkrieg. It was, you know, they had 64 attacks on Darwin during that time period between 42 and 43. And um, Mossman and Townsville got bombed, Horn Island, um, and a couple of, a broom, I believe, over in Western Australia also received bombing. Um, but the way that we actually approached that within our newsreels in Queensland was very different to how we approached it in uh, the Northern Territory in that, and, you know, information around the war is such a fascinating thing. And the dissemination of information around the war is so interesting. But um, the, the bombings in Darwin were, for the most part, downplayed and suppressed. And that information was kept um, on a pretty tight leash in order to keep from uh, causing widespread panic. However, the bombings in Townsville were actually spoken about with uh, a level of humour and a lot of the articles surrounding uh, the Queensland involvement in the war and the events that happened to Queenslanders in the war tend to have a humorous slant to them and it's really fascinating to see. Um, so you can see here, for instance, some of the articles that um, you can find on Trove about the lone air raid casualty in Townsville's three bombings and it's this uh, coconut palm that was then, if you look at that middle image, it was actually cut down, put on the back of a truck and uh, wheeled around during the victory parades when Japan actually surrendered. And that's what that vehicle is. And there's something about that that I find really interesting in terms of if you want to look at source analysis and compare um, the humanity and the humour of uh, people at war and or people that are going through extenuating circumstances, uh, it's really interesting to see that through line of comedy and that through line of downplaying the severity of certain things uh, in order to find uh, a, a sense of connection and, and humour out of them. And that's why I've put this little meme at the end is because as far as I'm concerned, humans have been making this one joke for the last century or so and we just kind of keep repeating it. And I find that really, really interesting. And from a historian's perspective, that is really quite fun to see. Um, again, I can link to all of these articles. I've got a um, trove list to put together for them and they will all be coming through to you guys at the end of the presentation. Um, so this photo I thought was really uh, fun just because you can see the story bridge in the background and um, it's still sort of taking that lighthearted tone and that triumphant sort of tone, the way that it's structured and um, sort of shown off. These gentlemen are survivors from a merchant vessel that was torpedoed by Japanese um, uh, submarines, but they survived and you can see they've kind of got this hero's walk coming through and this real hero's swagger. This, of course, sort of is thrown in stark contrast to some of the photos of other members of this um, crew that were actually in hospital at the time being interviewed and those photos uh, tell a very different story. So for source analysis purposes it's really interesting to see what was placed in the newspapers and then what has actually entered our collection later that weren't chosen, what was left on the cutting room floor um, of history so to speak. Um, so when it comes to discussing events that rocked Queensland to its core and events that would have been absolutely um, inescapable as far as topics are concerned for children and everyone. The the centaur and the sinking of the centaur is definitely one of those. And you know the Battle of the Coral Sea is fascinating, but the sinking of the centaur is um, really pivotal for Queensland in terms of their like our understanding of the war. And it literally rippled through the mindset of every Queenslander, young and old alike. Um, Part of the fascinating thing about it, of course, is that the centre sank less than 100 kilometres away from Brisbane, the city centre. Big, big, brightly lit hospital ship, fully decked out with the signs, 
crew of 332, only 64 made it off. Uh, this ship is meant to have sunk, according to some reports, in the space of 11 minutes. Um, it was uh, a, it, it's, it's hard to fathom. And you know, it says that on the slide. Um, and the interesting thing about this as well is that, you know, we often hear about things like the submarines in Sydney Harbour and even things like the bombing of the Manly Ferry, uh, Manly Ferry, sorry, um, uh, the sinking of the HMAS Sydney by the Cormoran. These kinds of events are all considered to be these really brutal attacks, uh, fascinating attacks on Queensland, on, on, sorry, on Australia by the Japanese and by foreign forces during World War II. You don't necessarily hear about the Centaur so much, um, despite the fact that it was really, really important and it had this really impactful um, propaganda fueling role for Queensland and for Australia. Um, when you look at the articles around the Centaur sinking, um, all published in May 43 when it happened, um, they highlighted things like conflicting responses from the Japanese claiming that they didn't do it in some articles claiming that uh, it was a retaliation attack for sunk Japanese vessels from January. Um, basically, a, a lot of articles that play the Japanese out to be untrustworthy, not communicative, um, constant reports of the Japanese lauding this victory while telling um, us that it wasn't happening, those sorts of things. Um, but then also highlighting things like the fact that the Centaur ship prior to the war even beginning had done things like um, aid Japanese whaling ships uh, who were in distress calls. And so they really pushed this um, uh, image, this image of the Centaur ship as this agent of empathy across borders and grace. It always acted with grace and um, just really trying to further sanctify the image of the centaur and by contrast um, elicit outrage and betrayal against the Japanese. Um, and frankly, rightly so. This was, of course, one of those uh, events that again defies the laws of, of war. It's against the Geneva Convention to attack ships that are clearly labelled as hospital ships. Um, the ship was not actually located until 2009. Uh, and its final resting place was located by a gentleman called um, Peter Peter Realm, and he located as well the HMAS Sydney, the Cormoran. He's most recently been involved in locating the Endurance Shackleton ship that was uh, sunk in Antarctica during uh, 1915 because it went under the ice flow, and he's recently found that ship. Um, but the following photos actually show you the Centaur in its final resting place. Um, these images were taken uh, using an underwater ROV or a remote operating vehicle, uh, similar to the ones that were used uh, for the Titanic. Um, so you can see in this photo, the ship's bell is trapped between two um, uh, pylons on the ship and you can see the name clearly written there. Uh, this is part of the collapsed bridge. Uh, the ship itself is actually in one piece, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but there are significant holes where you can see it has been clearly been torpedoed. So the reports saying that it had not been torpedoed were false. Um, and it was only a, a kilometre out from where it was originally recorded as having sunk, which is pretty incredible considering it then took them uh, 73 years to actually find it. Um, and, you know, there's more images of this ship and its uh, debris field available online. They've all been published. Um, this one is particularly evocative, obviously, because of the uh, iconic slouch hat resting on the sea floor. Um, there are photos as well of the hospital bed frames and of pairs of shoes, very, very similar to uh, the site that you see when you look at the Titanic. Um, again, this is one of those um, things that can be a little bit emotionally triggering for some people um, and it deserves to be treated with um, you know all, all due respect this is a war grave and it is uh, listed and protected as such. Um, an interesting fact as well about the fact that um, things like the shoes and the slouch hats have survived uh, is that the reason that they survive instead of other kinds of textile materials is because of the way that they are treated specifically. 
um, the tannins that go into treating leather and the um, chemicals that go into felting hats are actually considered to be uh, antimicrobial and they are not interesting and unappealing to the uh, microorganisms that would otherwise eat them in an, aquatic, in an aquatic environment. So they tend to last disproportionately longer than other kinds of textile mediums uh, within an underwater archaeological setting. Um, this here is just a bit of information, again, a potential class exercise for things like those two sources that I just showed you. Um, I think that it's really interesting to look at things like the poster that we saw right at the start and um, the images of the centaur and to unpack things like the articles surrounding them and then to look at the images now and to look at things like the um, the sources, the biases behind them and to really uh, contrast them against each other and to help students to unpack what purpose those things serve, why were they created at the time and um, it's a really good example of that and to then potentially push it one step further and ask them to um, discuss what they think the reaction would be within the public. As we happen to know, it was, you know, vast widespread outrage and enormous support for nurses. Um, but given that there were only 12 nurses on board that ship, it's an interesting um, skewing of the story to create this avenge the nurses narrative when only 12 of those 332 people were in fact nurses on board the ship. Um, again, these are all uh, little bits and pieces that can come together to inform the broader sort of narrative behind childhood on the home front and childhood at war. These are things that um, kids would have been hearing adults react to, things that kids would have been uh, aware of in some way or other. And um, understanding that helps us to understand the broader um, social um, climate and environments that kids were being raised in at the time. So now we're finally going to move into um, children on the home front so that we can do a very quick sort of discussion of things like um, rationing and all of the usual stuff. So um, as teachers, you'll be aware that um, the passage of time uh, is very, very fast. <laughs> And you'll be seeing kids coming through every year and you'll you'll watch them grow up. And so you'll you'll be experiencing the passage of time in a way that's very different and very, very present for you uh, in comparison to people like me who happen to sit in an office all day and uh, avoid talking to people at all costs if I can. Um, except for donors who happen to be fantastic and share their stories with me, which is wonderful. But um, as a result, you've probably seen the change between um, class tasks such as uh, ask your grandparents to tell you about their experiences of the war. And instead of talking about World War One or World War II, you'll ask them and they might start talking about the Vietnam War. Uh, and so we're seeing at the moment that shift finally occurring where the last of the uh, World War II veterans are passing away. There were less than a thousand World War II veterans left in Australia in 2019 in the census. And we believe that that number has dropped significantly since then, of course, as well. Um, so the way that living history is changing at the moment is making it really interesting for things like class tasks that can be set and for uh, the way that we get students to interact with materials. The, mater the, the history that they can connect with is now actually stored almost solely in places like archives and in family photograph albums. But the voices that would be telling those stories and informing them are starting to disappear for good. Um, and so things like childhood in Brisbane during World War II are things that State Library is starting to collect stories about as much as we possibly can. Um, and so I have done a lot of work with um, uh, people who are uh, Brisbaneites and Queenslanders who were raised during World War II in Brisbane and in Queensland and capturing their anecdotes and talking about things like MacArthur and the parades and the air raid drills. Um, and those kinds of stories are really interesting because it's such a specific landscape as we were discussing before. Um, and it's something that has never been repeated again as far as we're concerned and hopefully it never will. Um, and so things like air raid drills and uh, the photographs of kids digging split trenches are um, really, really poignant um, and alien uh, 
uh, experiences now for people with that living memory starting to disappear. Um, stories of things like the blackout laws and curfews as well. Um, childhood anecdotes. Uh, I, I interviewed a gentleman recently, for instance, who spoke about how his um, scout troop shut down during the war because the uh, young men who were running it all went off and enlisted. And so um, the kids essentially left their own devices, decided to run their scout troop exactly as they had before, just without the leaders. And so they would occasionally go and trek all together, this group of 12 year olds up to Mount Kutha and stand up there and wait for the sun to set so that they could watch the lights all go out one by one uh, under the blackout laws. Um, and those kinds of stories are really fascinating because we don't have a photograph of Brisbane during the blackout laws um, from Mount Kutha as a vantage point. And so that story is only to be told through um, the voice of this particular individual. Uh, I have that oral history available. It is going to be linked at the end as well. Um, something particularly interesting as well from a, um, a, a women's perspective as well and a home front perspective are the concepts of victory gardens. Um, victory gardens being gardens that were created in public and unused spaces uh, to grow foodstuffs and um, flowers for things like convalescent homes. Um, Queensland had a very, very successful victory garden um, movement. Uh, there were, oh, how many? I think it was 38 in total within the Brisbane region at one point. Uh, and they were so successful that at one point the um, newspapers were running articles from um, farmers saying that they wanted them to stop running the victory gardens because no one was purchasing their pumpkins and their uh, produce and it was rotting in the field because no one was buying it because the victory gardens were too successful. Um, yeah. Which is a really interesting little uh, anecdote as well. Um, children on the home front in Brisbane would have also been exposed to things like parades because parades were a enormous spectacle that were occurring at the time and they were quite frequent. It was a way of uh, instilling morale. It was a way of showing um, that Australians were safe and that Brisbaneites were safe. It was a way of welcoming uh, different uh, soldiers and military groups. And it wasn't just the US or Australian forces that marched. It was women's services, the AWOS, the WAF, the land army, the women's land army also marched at times. Um, the Dutch merchant navy marched at times as well through um, Brisbane, including during the victory marches, um, which is really, really interesting because, you, again, you hear about the US forces moving through Queensland as a significant um, sort of part of World War II. You don't hear about the Dutch so much. Um, and so Brisbane, incredibly uh, vivacious sort of time for Brisbaneites and for kids. There were parades, there were US servicemen providing things like sweets and candy and chocolates and tickets to go and see movies because they were earning more than anyone else was at the time. And so kids were having their first experience of chewing gum as a result of US servicemen being present in Queensland and in their lives. Um, and as a result, uh, a lot of kids that grew up in Brisbane during the war that I have spoken to myself, both anecdotally and through um, various kinds of res research, uh, found that they had quite a uh, rosy coloured nostalgic lens through which to view uh, World War II. Uh, that was not always the case for people who grew up uh, in northern or regional or rural areas. Um, this image I absolutely adore. This is uh, from our archive as well. This is uh, an image of children digging the trenches in front of their schoolyard, which was a compulsory requirement for all schools to reopen once Japan entered the war. Um, beyond that as well, kids were also expected to um, wear, do gas mask training, wear helmets, all of those sorts of things, and uh, obey blackout laws and curfews. Um, when it comes to the inland and up north uh, experience of childhood, um, there were, of course, the similar experiences. Every school in Queensland, it didn't matter how far away you were, was expected to do things like slit trenches and air raid drills. Um, and everyone faced things like uh, rationing. But uh, those who lived up north also faced the ongoing threat of, at the time, what was perceived to be invasion. And so uh, they did actually have experiences where 
families would move themselves and their kids from places that were regional or places that were northerly and on the coastline, and they would send their kids either to relatives further inland or further south. Um, and as a result of that, uh, you occasionally hear stories about um, things like uh, groups of little girls having to sleep on open air verandas in Toowoomba. I recently had a donation come into the library from a very sweet elderly lady who told me all about having to stay in the winter on this balcony and her um, complaints 75 years later remained the same and they were that her toes had never felt that cold before in her life and they had never felt that cold again. Um, and so those kinds of experiences and the um, it, the subtle kinds of um, make do and mend things were more pronounced for those that were further outside of the city. And um, yeah, things like rationing and things like um, uh, the fear of invasion were really, really present for those that were closer to the war front and closer to places like Papua New Guinea and closer to the Torres Strait and closer to places that had actually experienced air raids. Um, and that did bleed into childhood experiences of the war. Um, austerity measures I just touched on a little bit, but I think that a lot of people underestimate just how broad they actually were um, and just how much of public life uh, austerity and rationing actually affected. Uh, so the image on the left is the um, Father Christmas signs barred. Uh, which was uh, a way of stopping shops from trying to sell more things during Christmas and encourage people to spend money. They didn't want people to do that. They wanted people to live as plainly and as soberly as they could and keep the resource expenditure to an absolute minimum. Similarly, that image over on the right is actually an image put up in front of a shop front to show how much of the um, ration uh, sort of allotments they had already run out of for the day. And um, you can see from that sign, you know, frock, frock quota sold out, um, coat quota sold out. It was um, all kinds of uh, clothing, all kinds of foods, butter, meat, eggs, um, all kinds of foodstuffs were um, completely rationed out. Um, yeah, and even down to things like images of Father Christmas to encourage joy and spending were considered to be um, rationed and controlled at the time. And that sort of thing made kids all the more um, appreciative of things like the generosity of US servicemen who would throw um, chewing gum to them over the fence of the uh, local encampments. And, you know, they were often having their first experiences of chocolate and sweets through US servicemen. Leading straight into the US servicemen. Um, so uh, the slide kind of tells you everything that you need to know in a way. Um, the fall of Singapore caused so much change and um, it caused the MacArthur family, of course, to move down first to Melbourne and then up to Queensland to begin its base of operations uh, for the entire US front of the Pacific War and the grand push back upwards. Over a million US troops are said to have moved through um, Australia throughout the war, which is a ludicrous number of people when you realise that, you know, Brisbane at the time only had 335,000 people in its population and was the third largest city in uh, the whole of Australia. Um, and as a result, Australia faced this whirlwind exposure to all kinds of US culture and entertainment. And it really did permeate the uh, time from a uh, cultural mindset. And this, this foreign presence, this benign foreign presence did have its moments of tension, both for adults and for kids, um, particularly in adults because the um, young women in particular were um, considered to be susceptible to the wiles of US servicemen. Um, and, you know, because US forces were making more money than um, the Australian forces, and that's not a case of making money in the sense of dollar for dollar. 
because they were technically on the same wages. But because the US were being paid in US dollars, the transfer was um, definitely in their favour. And so they had more money to spend whilst in Australia than the, US, than the Australian forces did. Um, and they had uh, as well unprecedented access to things that were widely rationed in Australia, things like nylon stockings, which were um, so strictly rationed that we produced a kind of um, liquid nylon, which was a kind of prelude to the fake tan. Um, and it was a stain that you would use on your legs to produce the facade of being a, a lady who could afford and wear nylons um, because it was considered to be still at the time an incredibly... Um, uh, it was definitely against the mainstream to not wear stockings and to have bare exposed legs. But of course, um, that material, this, this liquid nylon, was actually made out of a chemical that could then be used later in the war. And so that then also got um, requisitioned and rationed and uh, even liquid nylons weren't produced. Um, yeah, there were reports in London of um, the rationing being so um, strict that women were using tea bags instead to stain their legs to give the illusion of wearing nylon stockings, but it meant that they had to run every time they uh, had a spot of rain because their nylons would start streaking down their legs. Um, so the US forces by and large were considered to be this um, saving grace. They were coming to Australia to help protect us and to help push out this foreign potential invader and to help retake the Pacific. Um, and as a result, there was all kinds of things produced in their honor. There was music, um, some of the uh, songs that were written even on the ships coming across from the US, uh, things like the Aussies and the Yanks are here. Uh, written and we have the sheet music here at State Library, um, became instant hits when they arrived here in Brisbane and uh, were quickly copyrighted and slapped onto records and things. Um, but the, the that music and the um, general excitement about the US forces being here, it cannot be understated. And that uh, presence really did spur on a lot of different cultural changes here in Australia. Things like um, the, the, the music scene was changed just by the fact that uh, African-American soldiers were coming through. And so jazz was picked up and uh, rhythm and blues and those sorts of musical influences are suddenly seen in the nightlife in Queensland and in Brisbane. And um, they're seen... Uh, throughout all other things as well, like um, culturally clothing started to change in certain ways to further reflect um, US presence. And um, uh, there's, there's, there's a litany of things that one can uh, reference here. But um, I think that one of the more important ones to talk about is the fact that um, the, the soldiers, because they were here and, you know, not all of these men were single, um, they would still be lonely people and they would need to uh, have places to go when they were um, on rec leave. And so there were whole families in uh, Brisbane and in uh, Queensland that would actually do things like host Sunday roast dinner nights and they would invite US servicemen who were married or who didn't want to have to go out and try and brave the nightlife or anything like that to just come around and have family dinners and hang out and play, you know, bingo with them and do stuff like that. And I've heard those anecdotes firsthand um, from a lovely older lady who uh, donated a fantastic doily that was handmade by her, uh, her grandmother and it had the words emblazoned on it, the Aussies and the Yanks are here in honour of that fantastic song that was written at the time and she would crochet these things up in a manner of minutes and give them out to people. And so she'd kept one for herself all these years and um, has donated it to the library. Um, in terms of, um, oh, yeah, other cultural influences, things like baseball uh, were widely introduced to Australia and um, were played. We have here at the State Library a baseball that was um, used to play on Christmas Day between Australian and US forces. And it's signed by all of the young men who were in that baseball game. 
Uh, we have a 3D digitized version of this baseball also on display at the Anzac Square Memorial Galleries. So if you ever have a chance to take your students out of the classroom and on a bit of a, an excursion or a field study opportunity, I would highly recommend dropping into the Anzac Square Memorial Galleries because the material in there really does um, breach that gap. It, find, it gives kids that uh, opportunity to actually drill down into something that catches their fancy and, and make that connection across the breach of time and understand that these people 75 years ago, 100 years ago, whichever period of war you happen to be studying, were still young people with hopes and fears and uh, things going on in their lives that can be mapped onto our experiences today. Um, and I really love this photograph from our collection. I think that it's just an absolute joy. Um, so this is, again, another class exercise that can be used with those two images. Um, it's, you know, some prompt questions for them. Um, things like the symbols and activities on display is really interesting when you look at those two photographs again, um, because, you know, there's so much going on in both of these images that really tell a story. And you can see um, that this photo is very, very posed. But this photo here, you can see that sort of naked joy in, in their faces. It's very unstudied. Um, and, you know, these kinds of images allow us to try and unpack some of that bias that gets carried through into today's media. And it hopefully will allow students to look at historical images and use those skills to then um, navigate the world of information and misinformation that we happen to be trying to tackle today. Um, so in terms of childhood at war, there is sort of one kid that does need to actually be acknowledged and that is Arthur MacArthur. So Arthur MacArthur was the son of uh, General Douglas MacArthur and he had what is probably the most unique experience of World War II uh, of any child in the war. This child was, um, uh, he was evacuated out of the fall of Singapore. He was uh, alongside his mother and his father the entire time of the war. And he was raised uh, in Brisbane during the period where MacArthur was um, manning the headquarters here at MacArthur Chambers and directing the entire war effort from those chambers. He was living here with his mother and a uh, nanny whose papers we happen to have here in the collection uh, from the Moncrief family. Um, so this child really did face um, a really, really uh, unconventional childhood. He was almost like, it, it's only comparable to things like what Prince William and Prince Harry and, um, you know, the the most recent generation as well of royals have faced. This child would get, um, you know, hounded in the streets by photographers and by members of the public who wanted to thank him for his father's service and all of these sorts of things. He was presented with at one point, a chariot built for him that was um, dragged through the streets by a goat. And it was a gift because he'd had his birthday and the uh, grateful Queensland public wanted to present him with these sorts of presents all the time. And it really did kind of shape who he was as a person, as well as the fact that he had to live in the shadow of a man who was... Um, he was campaigned to run for president. He didn't campaign to run for president. He was campaigned by the US public twice to run for president, once while he was overseas in Australia, um, currently serving the war effort. Uh, that's how um, popular this man was and how divisive he was as well, because he, he, he's, he inspires a lot of hatred as much as he inspires um, uh, gratitude in people and and adoration because of his failures and um, the the human side of and failings of someone who is just a human being in the grand scheme of things. Um, as a result of this wildly strange life that this uh, young child had to live through, um, the adult Arthur MacArthur actually ended up becoming a hermit and he lived under a false name in a, an apartment in New York for the entirety of his life in obscurity. Uh, we believe he's still alive. 
but uh, given that he operates under a false name, it's kind of difficult to um, speak with him about it. Um, in terms of covering other kinds of experiences of war, not all experiences were the idyllic soldiers giving you candy and getting to see victory parades in the streets kinds of experiences that a lot of the Queenslander children actually faced. They were, even in what was a very stressful and tense period of time, somewhat inoculated from the realities of the war, even if the adults above them were not as inoculated from them. Um, as such, you had children from Australia and from Queensland who were um, exposed to actual war fronts and to um, things like being prisoners of war. Um, expats, diplomats, uh, people coming from Singapore who didn't make it out before the fall um, were captured and were kept in uh, prisoner of war camps alongside um, POWs and they spent their time in those camps up until the uh, closure of the war. Um, uh, similarly, um, Australian families that had moved to Papua New Guinea uh, during the, uh, the Papua New Guinea at one point was a territory of Australia uh, or it was run as a territory of Australia and was under the control of Queensland. And so Queensland invested significant portions of money into developing the infrastructure of Papua New Guinea. And that meant also sending um, Queensland families to try and implement those things and to implement governance and road works and schooling and all those sorts of things. And so there were entire families that were still there when um, Japanese forces invaded. And so those families were vulnerable to all of the worst outcomes of war. India, um, just, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt for one second. It's just gone five. Um, I'm so sorry. I am I mean, I'm happy for things to keep going, but I'm just aware of people's times in the evening. So, Of um, course. Um, that's okay. I'm happy to finish up there if you would like. Otherwise, <laughs> um, most of the information is still available on the slides and then that's it. So that's all good. As other, well, I mean, we could always check with people. Um, could you just sure. up, up the top? Um, there's a reaction button. If you're happy to keep going, if you just want to give a thumbs up, um, that will let us know. Uh, otherwise, um, we will be sending India's PowerPoint out. So we're there. Um, yep, yeah, so yeah, a couple of people are fine with it, India. Um, I'm okay, I was just checking, yeah. If you're okay with that too. I mean, it's also yeah, absolutely. Well. No, I'm absolutely fine with that as long as people are happy to keep going and they're still relatively interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know that this is very much an onslaught of um, thoughts and information. So um, I'm more than happy to keep going and just sort of cover a couple more aspects of childhood and Australian um, children's experiences of war, as long as we're okay with that. I'll only be another five minutes, I think. Um, so uh, allow me just a second to jump back into the thing. Um, okay, let's have a look. From the current slide, and okay. sorry, gang. Exiting the slide has thrown me for a loop, so let's do this again. There we go. Okay, so um, there is a collection here at State Library called the Kevin uh, McLaughlin album, and it is um, a really, really interesting album of photographs. Uh, Kevin served in the uh, Pacific arena of World War II, um, but specifically he was involved in the um, repatriation of prisoners of war, and that also included uh, children. And so a lot of the photographs in his album actually show the realities of that experience to some degree, or at least of the um, repatriation efforts of those prisoners of war. So you can see in the photograph there to the side, a mother and a child who were um, uh, kept in a prisoner of war um, camp during the war and were finally being uh, returned to Australia. 
So there are a lot of images in that album that are really, really fascinating to take a look at, and they would make for um, very, very good um, studies, case studies again, or um, source studies for students if they did want to uh, look into this subject specifically. Um, beyond taking it one step further than the prisoners of war, um, there are also cases of Australian children who were victims of war. Um, so I've listed in this particular slide here the two major events that are considered to be some of the most e egregious against Australian um, youth in times of war. Um, Rabaul is one in particular that is, uh, it cannot be understated what happened there. Um, so Rabaul was a small town in Papua New Guinea that was full, again, of those expats, diplomats and um, families of Australians and particularly Queenslanders who had moved there as part of the uh, scheme to develop the infrastructure. And those people, um, some had been evacuated prior to invasion, but most hadn't actually expected it to occur or to occur as quickly as it did. Um, there was a really small unit of Australian soldiers who were posted there. Um, as you can see, the average age for those soldiers was 18 years and six months. Um, they were um, not well trained. They were garrison kind of kids. They were put there as a base to support things like the broader movement up towards the Pacific. Um, those soldiers were um, rounded up and they were killed in some of the most um, brutal and unrelenting uh, ways that one can be killed and their bodies were not actually um, buried in any way. They were simply covered with palm leaves and left behind uh, on the site of a plantation, the Toll Plantation Massacre. Um, so similarly, the children of those civilian families were um, rounded up, captured and placed on board the Montevideo Maru and the Montevideo Maru was a prison ship. Um, that prison ship was also full of the uh, soldiers that hadn't been uh, massacred in the Toll Plantation massacre. Um, it was full of um, families, scared people who were um, pushed into these sort of luggage holds that were um, small, hot, and um, incredibly uh, cramped with no windows and no way of escape. And that ship was mistaken for a warship and received friendly fire from US forces. Um, the ship went down in seven and a half minutes, according to the reports. And uh, that is a small mistake on my slide. There were no Australian survivors. 20 of the uh, Japanese uh, crew did make it off the ship. Um, that uh, event was not actually um, widely dispersed within Australia or circulated, like the news of that event wasn't circulated at all. Um, and the fact that it was a prison ship wasn't circulated. The fact that it was sunk by friendly fire was not circulated. And the families of those who were lost aboard that ship were not told um, for decades. Uh, the files surrounding Rabaul and surrounding the Montevideo Maru, if I recall correctly, were sealed for 47 years. Um, and so for many families, they just didn't know what happened to their relative um, until decades later. Um, and that definitely has echoed through the experiences of generations of Queenslanders and generations of other fellow Australians. Um, and so, of course, there were children on board that vessel as well. Um, in terms of um, unpacking some of these really uh, horrific events uh, for children uh, in World War II uh, and the Montevideo Maru particularly, um, it's interesting to look at how these events happened, what um, triggered those events to happen and then how it was actually communicated back to the public. So the likes of comparing the Centaur to the Montevideo Maru uh, makes for some really fascinating um, case studies. Um, and 
particularly the way that they were treated by the government and why they were treated that way. Both of these events were tragedies. Both of these events involved significant losses of Australian forces. Both of these events were considered to be disastrous naval failures. But um, why one was communicated to the public as a call to action and the other one was suppressed is really, really interesting and something that could be definitely explored in class discussions. Um, and of course, the broader subject of censorship in general, because I mean, when you look at these kinds of things, it really does boil down to censorship and the fact that they didn't want to communicate the fact that it was in fact a US uh, vessel because we were currently so grateful for them being in Australia that to do that and to potentially trigger tension could have been just as bad as the event occurring in itself, as well as then triggering further political um, fallout and backlash. But that's not the only reason, of course, that is an aspect of it to consider. Um, that is essentially where we come to a close. So um, Queensland and the mythology of the war era it's really interesting to look at the perspectives of children and um, childhood from World War II, both at the time and then now as well, because the voices that are left will tell you all kinds of incredible stories and all kinds of wild narratives that have kind of developed up around um, the war and the war experience in Brisbane. Um, the fact that you'll hear about things like tanks in the bay and, um, you know, jeeps buried in the soccer fields because the US didn't want to take their um, cars back with them or any of their military assets because it would crash their motor vehicle economy back home. Um, but whether these things have um, any basis in reality is another thing. Um, things like the uh, air raid shelters and the relics that hide in plain sight around us all the time. Um, it's, it's really interesting to see those things and to try and um, get students to engage with them. Um, it really does help to um, further bring the war back out of um, the US film industry and the uh, English film industry and back into um, the real space that we live in now. And to map that history onto real places helps, I think, to really ground students in what it is that they're learning and see the value in it. Um, so that's where I finish there, guys. That's That's the whole thing. Sorry, guys. Um, just about to post into the chat um, the resource that India has done it for today. I will send it out tomorrow for those people who suddenly my screen doesn't want to uh, decide that it's going to work. Um, nope. I will find a way of making it other or I'll send it to you tomorrow. I have added um, a couple of things that people asked for during uh, which was the links to the photos of the young women playing baseball and the um, uh, the American soldiers. So I found those on our one search and I've added that to that document uh, so that everyone has that as well. Uh, so just going to finish while I'm just trying to make this resource work. Were there any questions that anybody had? Um, you can unmute, unmute your uh, mics and ask you tap it into the chat. Um, and so India can see it. Um, it's okay if there aren't. I'm also just more <laughs> than happy to um, get emails if anyone wants to ask questions or if you're interested in particular sources or um, further thematic things that can be explored through our collections. I'm more than happy to communicate that to anyone afterwards as well. Um, unfortunately, no, I don't think there are any questions, India. That's perfect. Oh, there we go. Oh, we, um. <laughs> oh, that is a good question. Um, I will have to look for you because I, uh, I think, I think it was, um, it was one of the ones in Brisbane, but um, I'd have to double check the source. Um, it is one in Brisbane because I was literally looking at it yesterday, but now it's also escaped my head as well mm. as to which one it was. Um, um, there is a fantastic photo as well that I love of more trenches being dug. It's these two young women right in front of the oh. University of Queensland building. Um, 
and they're both standing in the trenches with these helmets on and they're holding up their um, sword, swords, their shovels with the goofiest of expressions. And it's just a brilliant photograph seeing the split trenches right through that really iconic um, landscape of UQ. Um, um, the school, I found it, the school is uh, Ascot State School. There you go, yeah. Ascot State School. Um, and Ascot Racecourse was also used as a um, military base at the time as well. All the racecourses were. They were all requisitioned for US forces to build tent cities on. So I th any other questions? All right. Um, so th thank you, Indy, for sharing in-depth discussion about the impact of World War II, lives on Queensland and, uh, sorry, on lives and the experiences of children in Queensland, my brain has also decided that it's the end of the day. So it's the time to wrap up our section and I'd like to thank everyone who's out, who's still here for um, joining us and also the people who have had to leave. Um, I've put some links up in the chat as we went. Uh, we'll also send them out. I'm going to I'll link also to our survey monkey as well. If you'd like to fill that in now, it'd be very much appreciated, but we'll also send that out tomorrow as uh, well. Um, unfortunately, it's our last PD for this year, So, but please keep an eye out for the PD sessions next year. We're finalising our topics and we'll publish them soon. And in the meantime, please check out our new resources on Curriculum Connect. We have published talks from our Teacher and Teacher Librarian Symposium, which was held in late July, as well as our new resource on Eddie Mabo and the 30th year anniversary of the Mabo decision. And new, three new resources linking this to the State Library's current exhibition, which is Queensland to a T, uh, which is suitable for year four, uh, three and four HASS, um, junior secondary um, HASS and uh, 11 and 12 um, social and community studies. Um, so lastly, we're publishing a learning resource to supporting today's session in the next couple of weeks um, for you to use with your class using some of India's uh, examples as well as others. Um, and there's an activity sheet that can be used to support visits to Anzac Square Memorial Gardens. So please don't forget to sign up to our e-learning newsletter to receive our details and bookings, um, which should be available on the State Library of Queensland's Curriculum Connect resource. And I will add one last uh, bunch of links for people so you can have a look at all the many, many resources that we have to support you. All right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, coming this evening. And I think we can uh, leave it there. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>